Discussing one's own intellectual journey might seem on the face of it to be a rather pointless effort at best, or a narcissistic one at worst. After all, why should anyone care what I think and why I think it? It's a perfectly reasonable question, really. I suppose there are two important reasons for examining a person's intellectual journey, though. For one thing, it can help the author clarify his own ideas to himself and to the audience by taking inventory of what he believes and why he believes it. Secondly, if the author is part of an ongoing trend, there are perhaps lessons that can be learned from a wider movement with the author acting as a case study, which you could say I am having been through the notorious libertarian to far-right pipeline. My own ideological journey starts, like virtually everyone, based on where and how I grew up. I was raised in a sparsely populated red state with nominally Christian parents who had moderately conservative values and come from a pretty blue-collar culture. As someone growing up, you tend to take on the ideas and ethos of your surroundings. I was, from as early as I can remember, having a political identity, essentially a normie American conservative. I believed in liberty, freedom, smaller government, and a strong national defense. I didn't like the federal government. The liberals were the enemy, and I didn't think too much about American intervention abroad. I tended to think of the regimes being overthrown in the Middle East as controlled by really bad dudes, and it was probably a good thing to get rid of them. I distinctly remember, even as a little kid, getting excited to listen to Rush Limbaugh, which I listened to almost daily, and even the Savage Nation. I used to laugh at how Michael Savage would yell about red diaper doper babies, the flood of immigrants coming across the southern border, and the degenerates that had ruined California for him. While his mantra of borders, language, and culture was only half listened to at the time, it may have planted seeds in my subconscious that would only sprout later on. Things began to change a bit in the later stages of high school. At this point, I began to become aware of such people as Thomas Sowell, Walter E. Williams, and Milton Friedman. This was partially sparked by the 2008 financial crisis, and I began to read and learn about the merits of the free market system in terms of wealth generation, which I'd always vaguely been in favor of, and began to scoff at the bank bailouts as anti-market actions and begun to see the moral hazard involved in the creation of the Leviathan state and how it enabled and facilitated market and social distortions. I started to get really into economics, which bought me a one-way ticket to libertarianism. By the time high school was over, I was essentially a small L libertarian and much more skeptical of U.S. military involvement abroad. But then I went to university, and as things would have it, I slowly became radicalized. One of the key influencers on me at this time was Stefan Molyneux, who was, at the time, not anymore, part of the YouTube sphere which fashionably bashed Christianity in the wake of New Atheism. I never fell down that particular rabbit hole, but when he wasn't raving about the existence of God and the evil of religion, he was making some rather convincing arguments as to why the state was engaged in constant evil and how the U.S. military was a tool used by elites. This was around 2012, and it was largely his influence that persuaded me to cease my entry attempt into the United States Navy on moral grounds. It wasn't because I thought the U.S. military was staffed top to bottom with baby killers. No silly leftist nonsense like that. But I couldn't in good conscience be part of an organization which I thought was being controlled from the top by wicked people for dishonest ends. Around this time, I also became familiar with the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. While probably typing something nerdy into the search bar about the deleterious effect that zoning laws have on the housing market in urban areas in my college dorm room. While previously on the cusp, I now had the economic theory to back up where I wanted to go, and I became a thoroughgoing anarcho-capitalist. Tom Woods was my sage, Walter Block, my eccentric Jewish uncle, Thomas DiLorenzo, a slick Italian pedophilias, Bob Murphy was the wisecracking, pie-faced Irishman who had an answer to every idiotic thing Paul Krugman ever said. Dave Smith was there to make me laugh about how dumb statists were. And Murray Othbard was the old Father Abraham. Normies might have been following celebs, but the guys at the Mises Institute were kind of my rock stars. I loved the stuff. I ate it up. And because of my conservative upbringing, I felt much more comfortable with them than I did with the limp wristed effetes over at the Cato Institute. I couldn't get enough Mises. I love Mises to pieces. To me, the world was the market. I wanted those GDP numbers to go up and up. 
I was an open borders guy because that would clearly grow the economy. And it wouldn't be a problem because obviously all the land would be privatized and I could keep the unwanted out of my little gated community with private security for the riffraff and crowdfunded nukes to scare China away and we'd be wealthy as shit. Even my theology, slowly morphing into a kind of pseudo-Christian deism, began to be based entirely on property rights. And then all that began to slowly change around 2015 when I heard internet blabbermouth Gavin McInnes make a faithful offhand comment which I never forgot. Mexico sucks because of Mexicans. This is Mr. Patriarch reminding you to keep it real and live Logos.